Hello and welcome to part B on the uh, presentation on the Ampere and Regency ear fashions. This will concern men and women's clothing. Let's talk about men's clothing, shall we? In 1789, uh, clothing became more or less ostentatious. Pardon me. <clears throat> the frock coat was replaced by the tailcoat or the cutaway. Waistcoats are now square cut at the waist. Both are double-breasted. Knee breeches were made of nankeen. So you can see a simplification. The collar and the reverse of the tailcoat were separated by a notch. You can see here reverse or lapels. Notch. Notch. Big high standing collar. So for uh, street fighters, due to the terror of the sans culottes we had talked about, which means without breeches, popularized the lower class um, working men's clothing. Most of these was a uh, distinctive long trouser, the fall front trouser, and the bonnet rouge, the red cap of liberty. Also a short workman's coat with um, a semi-button sleeve called the carmagnole, and of course, your sabots. Let's talk about trousers for a moment, shall we? Start to see this. It comes from medieval French word trousers, pairs, or the Gaelic trues for a type of pants favored by the Celts. I don't know if you remember way back when, when we were studying the Romans, the Celts running around looking like they were wearing pajama pants. That was one of the trues. Um, probably a combination of both, the etymology of the word. Uh, they were mostly considered barbarian, medieval, unfitted breeches. But in France, the, they were introduced into France by, by Italian Commedia dell'arte players because they were cheap, they were easy to make, and they usually were made of broadcloth, and they could move around in them. <clears throat> they were first adopted by sans Collat after actors were protesting and satirizing the aristocracy. So they were making fun of the aristocracy by not wearing the more fitted breeches as attire unbefitting the working class who the Commedia actors were championing. And the son's club said, yeah, us, we deserve it. We're going to wear some trousers. If they're tight, tight, tight ones, they're called pantaloons, named after the comedic character Pantaloni, who would wear tight wearing red powders. And pantaloons, you're going to see trousers here, which are looser, looser cuff, and pantaloons, which are more fitted, particularly at the ankle, as you will see. After the terror, fashionable men once again wore tailcoats with reverse and high standing collars with wide lapels or reverses. Breeches mostly fall front and for a brief period had ribbon loops on the bottom hem. Uh oh, a little Baroque action going there. Watch out, boys. Don't go that way. Don't go to the dark side. Eventually, we start to see the long trousers of the revolutionary street fighters become adapted by fashionable society because isn't that what it always happens? Then you get the more pant-fitted pantaloons, oftentimes with a strap around the instep of the foot to keep them from riding up. <clears throat> Here's some La Increable, who sport a form of riding coat with a high standing collar and wide lapels. I know I'm starting to call them lapels more in reverse less. We're starting to get into that area where lapels and reverse are interchangeable. Hope that's not too confusing. Very tall, high water, not high waters, but very tall, um, fall front breeches, and then they were known for this cravat. That was their that was their gimmick, which covered either the chin or the mouth, almost like a mask, um, and then a tall bicorn hat. <clears throat> By 1800, the sleeves of the tailcoat were very long. You can see past the wrists. The cuffs were very small or non-existent. And then, interestingly enough, um, this fashion variation where you turn the coat pockets out. See, I am no rich man. I am a man of the people. See, I have no money. Knee breeches returned for a little bit and then went the way of the pantaloons. Two tailcoat variations during the empire, the swallowtail and the claw hammer. The swallowtail made famous by the emperor, tapering to a single point. The claw hammer with a wide slip up the back, like the claw of a hammer. Pleats, using to give, pleats added to widen the tails. And then here we have a very popular garment for men, outer garment. This is the Carrick, originally a heavy wool coachman's coat, um, because coachmen, you know, if they're in all sorts of weather on the outside, they need a good coat. And then um, it made the transition to fashion. 
particularly with this high standing collar and this interesting um, arrangement of shoulder capes. One, two, three, four, five. So uh, just attaching these shoulder capes over and over again to give this broadness to the shoulders, and that became a fashion accessory. Let's talk hats. <clears throat> a number of hats with stiff brims and high crowns. Of course, there's also the Bonnie Rouge and the Bicorn, but we have these high crown stiff brim hats like the Chimney Pot, you can see, with a high tapered crown. The top hat, made of beaver felt, has a flaring crown, an upward curving brim, and the stovepipe, which is conical and downward curving, often made of silk, used for evening wear. So that's the difference between top hats and stove hat. Top hats are upward curving brim, beaver felt. Stove hats are straight, conical, and made a uh, downward curving brim. Hairstyles. Uh, the Incarabla in, enjoyed this sort of mullet cut called the dog ears. So um, it's a mullet, so let's not talk anymore about that. Uh, interesting, because of this this take on classical neoclassicism, uh, the Brutus right, which is like the Caesar cut, um, brushed up and from the town crown the head. And then by 1800, a conservative haircut, um, particularly in England with the hair parted on one side, tight part, and then sideburns, which doesn't have a name, haircut with sideburns, I guess. Footgear, uh, low satin slippers we saw with bows instead of buckles. Very kind of feminine looking, to be honest, um, but fashionable at the time. Boots, riding boots were very popular. Wellingtons, you see, and Hessians, you can see the difference there at the top. Both have scooped out in the back so the knees can bend on horseback. And of course, the sabots or sabots for sabotage. Um, just some quick accessories. Swagger stick or sword stick. Short gloves carried in one hand. And then uh, some of the social groups like the Incrablas. Mervalous use a quizzing glass that you'd wore around the chain, wear around the chain around the neck so you can put up your eye to examine this upstart in front of you, obstructing your walk. You will be either happy or sad to know, depending on your feeling of 18th century, that women's clothing gets much, much less complicated in this era. Corsets are less rigid. Short wooden bust, so really just from uh, just under the bust line to the waist. So you're talking a really short three, four inches there, and not as tightly laced. Then you might have a long, long chemise, similar to a modern day slip. Also, women start wearing drawers in the late 18th century and 19th. They're more convenient, comfortable than the chemise petticoat arrangement. Put them on, tie a small bustle bag to the rear, give a forward slant to the body. You're ready to put on your garments. Just before the revolutions, we still see the overskirt petticoat, petticoat arrangement. However, they're simpler and the waistline is starting to creep higher. You can see here a fichu inserted in the neckline, a bustle pad, and we still have a vestige of the woman in both front and in the back of the powder pigeon, that poofing out of the front chest. Working class women, because they're so important here, a quilted petticoat. You can see on the left, Revolutionary Street Fighters got rid of the fichu and wore a chemise under a fitted bodice. And then usually the overskirt was an apron, uh, act as an overskirt. Here we see on the right a woman with her petticoat in the patriotic colors of red, white, and blue. I think that are um, red, blue, and white, actually, I should say. So I apologize to the French for that oversight. By the mid-1790s, the waistline is belted just under the bosom. The petticoat was less decorated, and the overskirt receded almost entirely to the rear. So you're starting to see a change from, oh, those are old-fashioned, those overskirt, underskirts. I'm just going to put it back here for a while. And then eventually, the single round gown that gained popularity with the rise of Napoleon consciously based on the ancient Greek styles of the chitin and the peplos, as you can see in these this comparison. Um, this is characterized by that high distinct key, distinctive high waistline, which will become known as, and is still known as, the Ampere waistline, which is basically belted just under the bosom. First of all, these were the fashionable and women, gowns of sheer muslin, 
worn only over a chemise and or flesh colored tights. So by the 1870, we see this is the characteristics of the Ampere gown. Floor length, simple belt or tie at the waistline. The neckline is low and square. A color originally white or off-white and the sleeves barely attached to the bodice are puffed and short only to the bicep. You're, I don't think, I don't, I don't want to say never, but yeah, I'm going to say never would you see an Ampere dress that did not have those short sleeves. Well, obviously an Ampere is always going to have to be belted under the bosom um, and also those short sleeves. They're not going to be longer. If I hope to God I don't come across one, particularly the slideshow, and look like a fool. Oh, good. So far, so good. Tunic dress. This is the chemise under here, or tie-on. This doesn't count. <laughs> um, a tunic dress is a fitted Ampere style underdress with a loose fitting outer tunic. So you can see in two parts here. Still Ampere waistline, low square neckline. Um, this one has a this one here has a lace insert, uh, but just a different style of Ampere dress. Here's a sleeve variation called the Mameluke. I believe that's how it's pronounced, Mameluke sleeve, tied in short puffs. And then another variation, maybe a long sheer inset here, under uh, short puff sleeves. Now you say, hey, that these are long. Okay, see, I already have to take that back because these are long uh, sleeves on, on pure dresses. So how long have I been teaching this course? Okay, here's an evening gown uh, following the same lines of the ordinary proper ampere gown with short sleeves longer train you can see made of silk this is made of silk or taffeta you can tell that very carefully it had pattern and embroidery along the hem by the late um, excuse me by the late ampere period day dresses begin to have that color and pattern also some pleated lace added around the neckline um, so you start to see this is a regular one this is one wearing out going outside you have this sort of lace collar here's another version called a uh, duillette which is one up one two three down the spencer jacket popular outerwear so you got you might have a spencer jacket which is a short ampere waisted jacket trimmed in downer fur still popular today you can see spencer jackets everywhere it was adapted from a man uh, a lord spencer I believe, who uh, had this short military jacket and women appears, oh, I like that. And then they took it for their own and it has been around ever since. The police again is back, which is now a, similar to a modern coat fitted in the Ampere style. Hairdresses, headdresses, uh, chimney pot hats, similar to the male version. Of course, the body rouge, the bandeau, remember that from days gone by? And then a turban worn with an ostrich plume to celebrate victory, Napoleon's victories in, your, in Egypt. Women in the Ampere period, particularly the Regency women of England, love bonnets, 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 and straw hats. One distinctive style, very distinctive for the period, is the Pope bonnet. A stiff brim bonnet, a bonnet with a stiff brim that encompasses the entire face. And the gypsy bonnet had a ribbon tie that went over the top and back of the bonnet. So, love them some bonnets. Hairstyles, of course, based on Greek and uh, Roman models. Um, one of the most popular, I'm just going to go straight to the bottom here. This is interesting among French women. This is a la victime, which is a type of Brutus cut or Titus cut. Uh, and, of course, the idea is that women going to the guillotine, the guillotine, excuse me, would have their hair cut so that the hair would interfere with the blade coming down on their necks. Hence the name a la victime. Fun fact there. Footgear, uh, not much to talk about. Sandals, very on the Romans, uh, based on Roman models, and of course the sabots. Other accessories, shawls, 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 shawls. You are not an Ampere woman if you are not carrying around a cashmere shawl. Just a square of rectangle draped around the shoulders or arm. Sometime fringe, sometime weighted in, but damn it, you must have a shawl. Elbow length gloves. Very popular for evening wear, with or without fingers. Uh, fans and muffs and reticules. Um, narrow silhouette of the ampere gown didn't allow pockets. 
so that necessitated a small handbag, a reticule. Here we also see a Betsy, not to be uh, confused with a doilette, which was three up and one down. Three, excuse me, one up and three down. This is three up and one down. So a doilette is three down and one up. A Betsy is three up and one down and is detachable. Specialty costumes of the era, um, a bicorn hat or a shako, shako, I believe, which this gentleman here, stocks made of horsehair worn around the neck, and then a wool tailcoat in regimental colors. The British wore red, the French wore blue. Here we see a uh, French cavalryman. The color of the French cavalry is rifle green. He is wearing a very close fitting waistcoat with a braid trim, no, trim known as a dolman fur-lined jacket and very tight-fitting pantaloons here tucked into Wellington, or excuse me, Hessian boots. Some quick examples, uh, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte, who would wear Ampere clothes, as you can see in an Ampere setting, definitely Ampere legs, Ampere chair, so, you know. Beau Brummel, we talked about, the square-cut waistcoat and the tailcoat and very high fall front uh, breeches with Hessian boots. Dolly Madison, um, a fat, yes, the first lady of the United States. Uh, her husband was kind of a schlub, but she was very fashionable and stylish and beloved on both sides of the Atlantic here in a classic <clears throat> Ampere gown. And of course, Pride and Prejudice. There's always tons of Pride and Prejudice um, adaptation, stage, screen, and television. Here's a movie from some time ago. There you can see the, the tailcoats, the Ampere gown with the long gloves. It's evening wear because she has the gloves on. Interesting. Uh, here at the bottom is an evening gown or a ball in the evening <clears throat> with the, the white um, cotton Ampere dress at top is outerwear. You can see the mother is a little old fashioned because she's still got an, on an underskirt. Not like these young forward thinking girls here who have on their polices and not um, in Ampere gown. This concludes part B and also concludes the lecture on Ampere Regency clothing. Thank you for listening.